spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Chaminade University. Well, good morning and happy Wednesday. I'm Ryan Kalei Suji, joined by Yanji Denise, and this is Spotlight Hawaii on the platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This morning, Yanji will be speaking to two guests as we focus in on the upcoming elections and zeroing in on the race for lieutenant governor. Yeah, it's been a while since we've had a double header. We are going to be joined by political analyst and UH professor Colin Moore. But first, a newly announced candidate in the race for lieutenant governor, that is businessman and former Honolulu mayoral candidate, Keith Amamiya. Keith, welcome. Hi, Yunji. Hi, Ryan. Thanks for having me. We're, we're happy to have you here this morning. Tell us a little bit about your decision to run for lieutenant governor. What went into this decision and uh, and what do you want voters to know about you? Well, UNG, I'm running for lieutenant governor because we need change. Uh, I'm running because I care about our communities. I'm concerned about the direction that our state is heading. And I want to create a better future for our younger generations. Uh, our state is becoming increasingly unaffordable for far too many families, and we need to do something about it. Uh, the current political establishment hasn't been able to get the job done. So we need new leadership, we need innovation, we need fresh ideas, and we need a new set of uh, people who come to government to make Honolulu and the rest of our state better for everyone and not just a select few. You know, you're coming off of a, another intense race, the race for uh, Honolulu mayor uh, that uh, went underway last year. Uh, talk about some of the lessons that you learned in that campaign and if that ultimately led to this decision to seek a, a higher office in the race for lieutenant governor. Well, I learned from the mayoral race that, that the public wants change, that they're demanding change. Um, it's no coincidence, I feel, that the top two candidates that advanced to the general election uh, Rick Blanjari and myself were first-time candidates. We never held political office before. And we were able to advance uh, amidst a crowded field that included many, many uh, political veterans. Uh, so that hasn't changed. The situation in our state hasn't changed. If anything, it's gotten a little more difficult because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the challenges that it has brought to all of us. So I want to continue. Uh, to bring change to our government, to bring change to the way we've been doing things. And I think I can do that uh, as Lieutenant Governor. I will bring passion, a commitment, and a team of people who are committed as I am to bring the much needed change uh, across our state. Uh, I was lucky to be able to build a team of committed people from young to old. Many times uh, they were people who never were involved in political campaigns, but they believed in the cause, they believed in me, and they're concerned about our future. Tell us a little bit about how you see the role of the lieutenant governor. It really depends, uh, just sort of looking at uh, people who have held that office before on the person and what they decide to do with this office. You know, you saw Shan Sitsui take it in one direction, and Lieutenant Governor Josh Green has been a very active and at some times vocal opponent of the current governor. Uh, how do you see that office? I see the role of Lieutenant Governor to support the governor uh, and his or her priorities. Um, it's a complimentary role, but an important role. There's just too many challenges facing our state that no one person can do it alone. So uh, I would look forward to working with the governor on his or her priorities. Uh, I'm gonna guess that they're similar to mine. It's we need to build a lot more affordable housing. We need to diversify our economy. And we need to do what we can to improve our public education system. Uh, so I look forward to that opportunity. And as you pointed out, Yanji, a lot of the lieutenant governor's role and function is based on how he or she, uh, what they do and what they make of it. Um, lieutenant Governor Green has shown that the lieutenant governor can have a major role, role 
in helping oversee and run our state. You know, and, and just to expand a little more on that, is there a specific area that you would like to focus on? Because when we look at past um, lieutenant governors who have held that role, you know, you look at someone like Ben Cayetano, who started the A-plus program and really made after-school care uh, a priority for him. Uh, we've saw different initiatives as well with Duke Iona, as well as the, the lieutenant governor at that time, Shan Tsutsui. Is there a specific area that you would feel uh, more, uh, that maybe you would elevate or that you would try to advocate more for in that role? Well, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of priorities and needs out there uh, from increasing affordable housing, uh, diversifying our economy and, and supporting our public education system. But first and foremost, we need to build more affordable housing. Depending on what study you read, we're short at least 40,000 affordable housing units across our state to meet demand. And that's a staggering number. And uh, as most people will agree, uh, the lack of affordable housing creates a lot of problems across our state and is the cause of a lot of our problems. Uh, first and foremost, it makes Hawaii unaffordable for many, many families, especially our younger families. Uh, too much of their income is dedicated to paying for housing, whether it's a mortgage or rent. So I wanna focus on that because that's far and away one of our biggest issues because Hawaii, as I said earlier, is simply unaffordable for too many families across our state. Voters will definitely have choices when it comes to the lieutenant governor. Already there are a number of people who have announced and there is a diversity in their backgrounds. We have Ikaika Anderson, of course, from city council, Jill Takuda and Sylvia Luke, who came from the legislature, Sherry Menor McNamara, who comes from the Hawaii Chamber of, uh, Hawaii Chamber of Commerce. Uh, what do you think distinguishes you in this field? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I've never held political office before. I think uh, we need a fresh perspective. We need change. We need a new style of leadership. I have a diverse background in terms of leadership experience. I've had leadership experience in the public, private, and nonprofit sector. Uh, I'm an attorney by trade, but I've also had uh, business experience in the insurance, real estate, and high technology sectors. Uh, I've served on the State Board of Education. I've worked at the University of Hawaii. Um, I've been in charge of high school sports across the state uh, for over a decade. And now I'm uh, uh, working in the philo philanthropic area, running a foundation that's purpose and mission is to help our communities, especially those in greatest need. And what role do you see the Lieutenant, of, uh, Lieutenant Governor's Office uh, play in response to the role that they the administration will have with the legislature. You know, we've seen at times that the role of the lieutenant governor oftentimes can be as a conduit between uh, the governor and his or her initiatives and facilitating conversations with the legislature. Is that something that you feel is a strength of yours that you would be able to manage those relations uh, within the Hawaii State Legislature? Well, as I mentioned, because of my diverse background, I've had the opportunity to work with the legislature for, for decades, really. And I hope to uh, utilize those connections, networks, and friendships that I've developed over the years, years to help the governor uh, and state government in general work with the legislature. Uh, there's far too many issues and challenges uh, that we can't work in silos. Uh, it's best that we work together and I have a track record throughout my career of bringing people together, of collaborating, of finding innovative solutions to complex problems. And I, I uh, want to continue to do that in my role as Lieutenant Governor. Tell us a little bit without showing too many of your cards about your campaign strategy, because we know, of course, that voters in the city and county of Honolulu got to know you pretty well during the last race. Um, but that, of course, was just in this county. And we're talking about the lieutenant governor's office, which is a statewide race. Uh, how are you going to navigate getting to know all the folks, all the potential voters on the neighbor islands, especially given the challenges of campaigning during what continues to be a pandemic? Of course, not the height. Uh, that you had to do it uh, for the gov for the mayor's race, but still uh, there is social distancing. You can't necessarily meet face to face with every voter. Well, you know, we've learned through COVID-19 that you have to be creative, you have to improvise. And, uh, you know, we have the technology to communicate via Zoom, 
uh, teams or other uh, forms of communication. So uh, it's always ideal, if possible, to meet people face to face. But if we can't, uh, I, I plan to utilize, you know, other platforms and technology to be able to commute with, communicate with the neighbor islands. Uh, throughout my career, I've had the privilege and experience of working and going to all of the neighbor islands and working with people uh, in every corner of the state, uh, dating back to my tenure running the Hawaii High School Athletic Association. I had the opportunity to travel to the neighbor islands many times, and I look forward to the opportunity to reunite and, and re-engage with people from across the state uh, while I campaign for lieutenant governor. Um, as one example, um, I, I can't speak for the other candidates, but um, I've had the privilege and opportunity to visit every corner of the state, as I mentioned, and including uh, every public and private high school across the state. And so I was able to develop a lot of relationships and can continue to maintain that relationships to this day. So I do look forward to uh, campaigning statewide. Right now, there are uh, presumably three candidates that you could be running with should you uh, win this election and move on to the general election. Of course, uh, Lieutenant Governor Josh Green uh, has expressed his interest and is basically campaigning, but has not made a formal announcement. Uh, there's also Hon former Honolulu Mayor Kirk Caldwell uh, and former First Lady Vicky Cayetano. If you can speak to your relationship with uh, all of them, are they? is there any one candidate that is running for governor that you would like to see uh, win that you feel that you have a better re working relationship with? Uh, I know all three candidates. And in fact, I've spoken spoken with all three of them about my intention to run for the lieutenant governor. I know them well. I respect them all. Uh, they would all make fine governors. And I look forward to working with whoever uh, comes out the winner in the uh, gubernatorial primary come next August. You know, we know that the mayoral election didn't go your way. What do you want voters who maybe didn't give you a chance in the last election to know about you to switch to turn the tide in this one? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Yunji, I, I advanced out of a crowded field in the primary to uh, make it to the general election. And so uh, I feel that my message resonated with a substantial amount of people. And uh, I just want everyone to know that I'll continue to run on and govern uh, with the same principles that I did while campaigning for mayor. That's to bring much needed change. That's to work with people, to collaborate, and to bring people together and find solutions to the complex problems facing our state today. As we wrap up our time with you uh, this morning, wanted to allow you one final message that you may have out there for, for those watching. and. Uh, your thoughts as we enter into this campaign season and you being actively involved in this process, uh, just your final thoughts here this morning. Well, I just want to thank both of you for this opportunity uh, to uh, introduce, reintroduce myself to the public and to explain my reasons for running for lieutenant governor. And as I mentioned earlier, it's that we need change. We need new leadership. We need a fresh perspective. I will bring that to the lieutenant governor's office. I will bring together a team of people who are just as committed as me, and we're going to work together for the benefit of everyone across the state, especially our working class families who are struggling far too much to make ends meet today. I'm committed to supporting them, to working with them, to do whatever I can so that they can make ends meet and not just survive in Hawaii, but thrive. Thank okay. you. Candidate for Lieutenant Governor Keith Amamiya, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I have no doubt that we'll be seeing quite a lot of you on the show in the coming months. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. Okay, Ryan, and now we're joined by our next guest to talk about this race. That is UH professor and political analyst Colin Moore. Uh, Colin, you heard what Keith Amamiya had to say there. And as we noted earlier, a pretty crowded field are ready for this race. Uh, your thoughts? Well, you know, this race is often a, a crowded race. Um, you know, the last time in 2018, we had um, five candidates. And so that, you know, that can make the strategy if you're running a little difficult because, you know, some candidates entering might be competing for, for similar voters. So, you know, the one thing about this race, when you have so many candidates and so many who I would call viable candidates, um, it's really unpredictable. And what that means is 
that the campaigns matter. In, in some races, campaigns are, are less important when you're running against an incumbent who has tremendous name recognition. But this is one of these races where the campaign organizations, the messages that come across are going to be incredibly important. And how important do you think the neighbor islands will play in, in this race? As Yanshi noted, all, the candidates that have announced thus far, all coming from Oahu, uh, you know, Sherry Manor McNamara made it a point to make her announcement uh, on the Big Island in her hometown of Hilo, maybe trying to sway some of those Big Island voters to see her as a neighbor island product. But uh, your thoughts on the role that neighbor islands, uh, the vote will play in this elect uh, in this particular race? You know, it's going to be important because like you say, you know, these are all Oahu based candidates. I thought that was a really smart move by Sherry Manor McNamara to take advantage of, of, of this announcement on a neighbor island. Now, of course, you know, the population isn't there, but, um, you know, that those votes can make a difference in such a crowded race. I mean, Josh Green, for example, last time won with 30 percent of the vote, you know, against Jill Takuda's 27 percent. So that margin, you know, that's where the neighbor islands can really be decisive. And they don't know most of these candidates, most most neighbor island folks. And so, you know, they're going to be meeting them, a lot of them for the first time, forming those early impressions. And that means, you know, some of the messages that get out and the time these candidates can spend on the neighbor islands, I think, is going to be essential. Yeah, and your your note there about Josh Green winning with 30%, it's important to remind folks that this race is really won and lost in the primary, and it's won and lost on a plurality, which means you don't necessarily need to capture everybody, you just need to capture enough. That's absolutely right. So, you know, one strategy, of course, is to turn out, make sure the people who already support you are going to turn out. And that, you know, in some ways, that's an advantage for candidates like Jill Takuda, who already has run in this race and has folks who voted for her before. Keith Amamiya, um, you know, as you just heard, who ran for mayor, um, you know, and had a lot of support, although he, he didn't ultimately win, you know, people have voted for him before. So, you know, those candidates in particular will wanna make sure that their past voters turn out again. You know, the other point I'd make here is that, so yes, it is a plurality and yes, because Hawaii is such a democratic state, whoever wins the primary is, is very likely to win the general election. Um, you know, and so you just have to get maybe 30 percent of 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 that vote. When we look at this role of lieutenant governor, it's an interesting one because they have no executive power. Essentially, they are uh, advisors maybe to the governor. They are support to the governor. But ultimately, the decisions and the things that they say really have no authority because they don't have that executive power behind them. Uh, having said that, how important do you think the stances of these candidates and their stances on issues will play, knowing that even though they may believe uh, a certain topic, say, if they are for or against TMT, ultimately their decision and their, uh, you know, their views on it is not something that will turn into law or change anything because of this lack of and an non-existent executive power. How, how do you think the issues will play into this role of lieutenant governor? Well, so, so you're right. I mean, actually, Hawaii's lieutenant governor has uniquely in the United States has relatively few powers. Um, but that's not going to be so much what voters are concentrating on. I mean, they will still want a candidate there who's going to advocate for their issues to advocate to the governor to pay attention to those issues. You know, and that's also how they're going to try to differentiate themselves from from their opponents. I mean, you have some candidates you know, who might struggle there. Be, I mean, for example, Jill Takuda and Sylvia Luke are, are both, um, you know, known as masters of policy details. You know, they're, they're um, well, Takuda, for example, is a former legislator. So those policies that they focus on can be ways to, you know, really stand out from the pack and, and try to connect with voters on the issues they care about. Um, you know, and I suspect we're going to see, you know, a range of issues from tourism, um, of course, to COVID recovery, um, to affordable housing. Keith Amamiya just mentioned that, um, you know, and, and they're going to try to find some issues that stick with voters and particularly that 30 percent or so of voters who are going to support them. You know, talk about a little bit about what goes into a voter's mind when they vote in, on this race in particular, uh, because of the challenges that, of that office that Ryan and you just laid out. Is it more just their feeling about this person? What are people really voting on when they vote for lieutenant governor? Well, emotion is always a big part of politics and a big part of people's um, you know, decisions to vote in some ways more than policy. You know, one of the challenges in this race, because it's so crowded and because 
there's going to be you know three strong candidates for governor who are going to suck out a lot of the oxygen from the room. Every House and Senate seat will be up for election. Um, a lot of this probably will come down to some sense of name recognition and their ability to connect with the candidate, a sense that you know that's the sort of person that supports my issues. Um, you know, or or seems aligned with what I care about. And and the challenge for these candidates really is to break through the noise. Um, you know, that's gonna be that's gonna be their central challenge. And for some of them, even to to um uh to, to make it clear, I mean, to, to try to connect with voters and, and get some name recognition. I mean, and this is where money becomes so important because although some of these candidates, for example, like Sylvia Luke are, are very well known to people in politics and government, they're not so well known with your average voter. And so the challenge here is going to be through you know, their campaign advertisements, through flyers, through, um, you know, to the extent they can do in-person meets is just to try to get their name out there first and then they'll be able to talk about policy issues and try to connect with those voters. With those that have announced or uh, officially announced or said that they will be announcing of the candidates for lieutenant governor, do you believe there's a front runner in this race at this point in time? You know, that's the interesting thing about this race. There is no front runner that I can see. I mean, we have some relatively evenly matched folks. I think that you know, probably Sherry Manor McNamara is going to face the biggest hurdles because she's never run for office before. Um, you know, she doesn't have those connections. She'll have to raise a lot of money. But but of the other candidates, I think it, it's really it really could be anyone. And I think we're going to see as we see these campaigns shape up, we're going to begin to see someone, you know, pull into the lead like uh, slightly. Um, you know, I do think that there are two candidates who have slight advantages. Um, uh, Keith Amamiya, for one, you know, he just uh, he was the most recent candidate for an island wide race. He's likely to have strong name recognition. Um, Ekaika Anderson, he's going to be um, the only Native Hawaiian candidate in this race. I think that gives him a slight advantage. Um, you know, Sylvia Luke and Jill Takuda are both strong candidates, but I think one of the one of the challenges for both of them is is to some degree they're going to be um, trying to capture the same voters. Um, and so it's going to be, I think, a little more difficult for them to, to stand out. In advising someone on, you know, how to campaign in, midst, in the midst of COVID, what have you seen work and what does it work? Because I think that people want to know that they can touch and feel the candidate, but with COVID, obviously we can't. So what have you seen unfold just in the races that have transpired during the pandemic? What can those candidates learn from what their predecessors have already done? Sure. Well, well, social media, as you know, plays you know an increasingly outsized role in any campaign. Um, but I think those candidates who've used this effectively, um, you know, that's been to their great advantage during um, you know during COVID. And people are a lot more comfortable on Zoom, doing the sort of thing we're doing right now, and getting on webinars. So I think that availability um, will be a big advantage to candidates. And you know, the other advantage, you know, which is great for democracy, is it's it's pretty cheap. Um, you know, you don't have to spend a lot of money to have webinar events and, and um, electronic events to connect with voters. Um, you know, the other thing that works, though, of course, is in a time like this is going to be traditional media is going to be advertisements. And, and that's expensive. You know, that was an advantage, for example, that I thought Rick Blangiardi had in the mayoral race last time. You know, there, there really wasn't the ability to get out there and campaign in a traditional way. But because of his you know, mastery of traditional media and strong fundraiser, I think that uh, that really ended up being an advantage for him. But I think unlike two years ago, for example, um, you know, we're going to see candidates and voters who are a lot more comfortable connecting online. So I think that's going to make their lives a little bit easier. Before we run out of time, we want to switch gears and talk about the race for governor or the Democratic race, I should say, for governor with three major candidates. Your thoughts uh, as we look forward to that race and, and electing a new governor to lead the state? Sure. So so unlike the lieutenant governor's race, I think we do. There is a strong favorite coming into the race, and that is Lieutenant Governor Josh Green. Um, he has extremely high approval ratings. You know, I think the last poll I saw, which was a few months ago, was 63 percent, really high. I mean, if you compare that, for example, to 22 percent for Governor Ige, that's not to say that that this is a sure thing. 
Um, it absolutely isn't. I think Vicky Cayetano has a compelling personal story. Of course, she has is very well known, was a very popular first lady. Um, you know, it also comes from outside politics. And we know, you know, from the results of the Honolulu mayoral race, you know, voters are, are interested in these candidates who aren't traditional politicians. And then, of course, Kurt Caldwell, who is very well known, um, has always been a strong fundraiser. But I think his central challenge is that you know, he is not very popular. You know, his approval ratings have been, you know, when he was mayor um, in the high 20s. And that's going to be tough for him to overcome because once voters make up their mind about you, it can be very difficult to change it. And that's going to be Caldwell's central challenge. I mean, if you look at that summation, it sounds like it's really Josh Green's race to lose. You know, it, it's funny you say that because, you know, talking to a lot of political folks around town, that, that seems to be the line everyone says. It's not a sure thing, um, but it's his race to lose. And so, you know, one of the interesting things about how this will affect the campaign is I think, I think you can expect Josh Green to, you know, um, not to engage in a lot of issues. I mean, just to highlight his performance during COVID. And it's going to be the challengers, Vicky Cayetano and Kirk Caldwell, who will try have to try to force him to engage in issues. Um, you know, and, and and so I think you'll you'll see two different campaign strategies. Um, you know, as this race begins to unfold, one of the strategies that we're seeing play out is just the delay time in this official announcement. I mean, we we know that these two candidates in Caldwell and Green are running, yet they have yet to formally announce. Why do you think that is? I mean, we had Kirk Caldwell on the show on Monday, and you know, he talked about all the issues. He basically said he's running without an official statement. What what do you the strategy you think behind that? You know, I think that's that's a great question, um, you know, especially because we know pretty much who the three candidates are going to be. It may be that he, for example, Kirk Caldwell is, is not maybe 100 percent sure. Um, you know, maybe he's trying to make sure he can fundraise as robustly as, as he'll need to. Um, you know, that could be one possibility. It may be that he's waiting for Lieutenant Governor Green to announce so he can sort of get a sense of of how the Green campaign is going to shape up and then and then respond to that. Um, I'm not really sure, but you're absolutely right that that it's getting to be pretty late. Usually we expect these candidates to announce about one year uh, before the primary. So now we're, we're well beyond that. We're almost out of time. And you're right. I mean, Lieutenant Governor Josh Green is already selling lawn signs online. So we know he's running, but he hasn't <laughs> announced. Um, tell us about the influence of money in both of these races. How, how much do you think will be spent in this cycle? Uh, and, and will this be a, a costly race up for both of these two? It will absolutely be a costly race. It was, um, you know, the last time we ran these races, it'll be costly again. Um, you know, certainly well over, you know, it, we're talking in the millions for the, for the governor's race. Um, you know, the other way money is going to affect the race, of course, are with independent expenditures, some of the PACs that we've seen in the past. Um, you know, for example, the, the Carpenters Union PAC, Be Change Now, has been uh, very influential in a lot of local races. You know, they contributed a lot to Lieutenant Governor Green's victory. Um, you know, when he ran for Lieutenant Governor, I think we can see a, a big role for them as well. So some of these outside PACs, um, you know, that are often here in Hawaii controlled by unions um, are likely to spend a lot of money in support of certain candidates. Uh, for the lieutenant governor's race, you know, money is going to be decisive because it's so crowded. What money buys is name recognition. Um, money allows you to send out the advertisements and the flyers uh, that allow voters to get to know you so you can stand out. And so so that's really what, what it gets you and in a crowded race. There's going to be a lot of money spent. Some of these candidates already have campaign war chests that are pretty sizable. Um, so it's it's going to be very expensive. OK, Professor Colin Moore from the University of Hawaii, thank you so much for joining us this morning and for sharing your insights on both these races. Uh, we look forward to hopefully having this conversation again as uh, this as we enter yet another election cycle and one that could be very interesting with a lot of races happening throughout the state. Sounds great. All right. Aloha. Thank you so much. Aloha. Well, really fun to talk about those races this morning. Uh, I loved his perspective on you know, what it's going to take and the idea that you really don't need that 50% plus one as you do in some races. In this one, it's just a plurality. So you could win uh, as Lieutenant Governor Josh Green did with just 30%. Uh, these candidates all hailing from Oahu. And so what's that going to mean for the race? I think this is going to be very interesting in Lieutenant Governor, the Lieutenant Governor's race. Uh, and of course, also the race for governor, as uh, as he said there, it is Josh Green's to lose. Uh, but you're hearing uh, that he, he's saying that there is no front runner for that race for Lieutenant Governor, which is why 
uh, it is important for these candidates, as he mentioned at the end there, to really raise that money to help build their name recognition throughout the state. Uh, also noting how important the neighbor island vote will be with all those major candidates that have thus uh, so far announced for Lieutenant Governor coming from the island of Oahu, the neighbor islands will play a critical role in uh, deciding potentially who that candidate will be, uh, just whoever is able to garner the most support on the neighbor islands, but definitely a race that we will continue to watch. And who knows, there may be more candidates that may <laughs> announce uh, in an already crowded field uh, with five right now. There, there could be more uh, as we move forward through this election cycle. Yeah, and if you joined us late, Keith Amamiya was here for the first half of the program. Uh, he, of course, announced over the weekend that he is running for lieutenant governor. And on the question of the neighbor island engagement, he did point out his experience uh, running high school sports and the fact that he's visited every public and private high school uh, in the state. And that could be an advantage. He said those are relationships that he has maintained. No doubt he will be drawing on those as the race unfolds. On Friday, we're going to be talking to someone who has not announced that he's running, but as we did mention he is uh, selling lawn sale signs and merch on his website, and that is Lieutenant Governor Josh Green. Yeah, a lot to catch up with uh, with the Lieutenant Governor as we continue to see our COVID counts go down. Uh, there have been calls for the governor to restrict some of the executive powers that the governor has uh, by the legislature. Want to get his thoughts on, on that and the role that that executive power in an office that he could maybe one day be holding himself. So we look forward to having that conversation again with the Lieutenant Governor here on Friday. Until then, stay safe and we'll see you then. Aloha. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii was brought to you by Chaminade University.